Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Gabriel Winan for a discussion of his book, The Next Shift, The Fall of Industry and the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America, in conversation with Katrina Forrester and Charles Peterson. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is through the support of authors and our beloved reading community that we're able to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for continuing to show up for us week after week. For tonight's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I'll shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copies of The Next Shift. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may have experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, I'm sure you have, technical issues may come up if any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and your understanding as always. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Gabriel Winant is an assistant professor of history at the University of Chicago. Previously, he was a visiting scholar at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His work, which primarily explores the social structures of inequality under modern American capitalism, has been featured in numerous publications, including The Nation, The New Republic, Dissent, and N Plus One. Katrina Forrester is an assistant professor of government and social studies at Harvard University. She is the author of In the Shadow of Justice, Post-War Liberalism and the Remaking of Political Philosophy, and has written widely on topics including sex work, policing, surveillance, and the gig economy for The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, Dissent, and elsewhere. Charles Peterson is a senior editor at N Plus One, where he has worked as an editor and a contributor since 2007. He holds a PhD in American Studies from Harvard University and is presently a postdoctoral fellow in the Cornell History Department and the Cornell Society of Fellows. His writing on 20th century American history, higher education, the history of meritocracy, and many other subjects has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, New York Review of Books, and many other places. This evening, they will discuss Gabriel's book, The Next Shift, a unique and timely portrait of the American Rust Belt and its ever-growing service economy that Eileen Boris calls a sophisticated, politically pointed, and beautifully crafted book, which chronicles both the erosion of the white male industrial working class and the ascendance of a service sector run by the labor of white women and men and women of color. Cities across the US, Boston included, have run a similar course. Mills closed and labor transformed, forcing generations of workers to navigate a burgeoning care industry based around unpredictable hours, low pay, and precarious job placement. If this pandemic has shown us anything, it's the faces of these workers. A population of overtaxed and under-resourced health specialists deemed essential, even as they go without adequate compensation and secure environments. In the next shift, Gabriel Weinant offers important insights into how we got here and what could happen next and how these employees can translate the increasing recognition of their economic value into greater political power. We're so excited to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Gabriel, Katrina, and Charles. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Benjamin, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all hanging in there. Um, it's great to see so many people in the audience. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation today and to celebrating the publication of Gabe's fantastic book, The Next Shift. So just a quick word to echo what's just been said about format. We're going to talk about the book to ask Gabe quite a lot of questions, probably for the next 30 to 40 minutes. Then we'll interweave your questions. So if you have them at any point, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll gather them and try and get through as many as possible. Um, 
So by way of starting us off, let me say something first about the book and why it really is an instant classic. So the next shift, as you've heard, is about working class life in industrial and post-industrial Pittsburgh. And through Pittsburgh's history, Gabe completely recasts how we think about the fall of industry and the rise of the care economy. It's also a really significant debate, um, a really significant intervention into debates about how to understand the legacy of the New Deal, how to make sense of and how to date deindustrialization and its many legacies. I find, think one of the most amazing things about the book is that it gives an account of how two different eras that we often understand in sequence, so the age of industry and the rise of the service sector and particularly the care sector, and how those sequential or normally sequential eras are interwoven and how the particularities of the US welfare state, its public private nature, birth the particularities of the healthcare system. Now, I don't want to talk for too long, but I just want to say a couple more things. It's also an amazing, intimate portrait of the reorganization of working class life. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today and how working class power that was so closely tied to social citizenship, to the private sector, to the family, how that power disintegrates and how the racialized and gendered hierarchies of that world provide the conditions for the world that follows. It shows how the gendered work of care, of social reproduction moves from the home to the hospital and how the hospital becomes like the home, a site of exclusion, hierarchy, commodification, class and racial formation, as well as a site of care and service. So this is a history both of the decomposition of the working class and how it was remade with some really important lessons for today. You should all buy the book. You should buy it from Harvard Books store right now who need our support during the pandemic you should also subscribe to m plus one gabe is one of their writers i think it's true to say he tried out many of his ideas from this book there first so subscribe they also need our support okay gabe to get us started can you tell us a little bit about pittsburgh why pittsburgh for you and why it's such an important site for telling this huge story about deindustrialization yeah, well, first of all, let me say thanks to both of you for joining me here. It's, it's so nice to get to do something like this with people who I've known and learned from so much over the years. And thanks to Harvard Bookstore and then Plus One for sponsoring. It's really uh, a privilege to get to participate in a kind of event that I've, again, gone to again and again and gotten so much out of. Um, so I, I, I'm from Philadelphia. I'd never been to Pittsburgh before I decided to study it, actually. It was like the other side of the state. It's very different over there. Uh, it was just an academic choice. And I decided to study Pittsburgh uh, for a couple of associated reasons that have at their core the fact that Pittsburgh has stood in for now almost 150 years as an emblem of the second industrial revolution, right? As the capital of American steelmaking, which was the industry that powered uh, the development of American capitalism from the 1880s to the 1920s, uh, built the rails, built the skyscrapers, Pittsburgh has been a place that people have gone to understand industrial society, its development, its fate, its significance for a very, very long time. The classic example is the Pittsburgh survey carried out in the progressive era by the Russell Sage Foundation, which was a kind of early moment of American social science, trying to understand what was this titanic social and economic transformation that was gripping the world and the country. And Pittsburgh is a place you could see it. So the city is cast in the image of industrialism in a really profound way. That generated archives of all kinds. Pittsburgh has been a place that since Russell Sage, many have gone to in some way uh, either understand as from an academic perspective uh, or you know, similarly, just the processes of production themselves have generated tremendous kinds of archival material. And it just generated a kind of neat um, ideal type, we could say, or case study. In 1950, which is about when the book starts, 47% uh, of workers in Pittsburgh worked for either steel, most significantly, or other kinds of manufacturing, or rail, or trucking, or mining, or construction, or warehousing. That's to say half the labor force was blue collar at, at, during the Korean War at its peak. Um, and so it seemed to me that it would exemplify the phenomenon of industrial society in a really powerful way, and then its fall in a really powerful way. And I'll just stop by saying today, uh, if you go to Pittsburgh, you know, the tallest building on the skyline is U.S. Steel Tower. 
and it no longer says on it USS, it says UPMC for University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is the largest tenant, which is why they get to put their name on it, and is the largest private employer in the state of Pennsylvania. So it seemed to me like I could get a really neat cut at the problem that I, problems that I was interested in by taking this city as a kind of exaggeration of the phenomena I was trying to understand. Great. Um, thanks so much, Gabe. It's great to be here. And it's so exciting to see a book that I've kind of witnessed come into being, you know, finally, finally be out there in physical form. Um, I literally just finished reading it, you know, five minutes before this. And um, it's, it's really a mind blowing book. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically, I just want to say congrats. Um, I think, I mean, one of the things that I think is, is so impressive about the book is that it takes these two stories that we kind of feel like we know well, one about industrial the industrialization and one about kind of the rise of the service economy or healthcare in particular. And, um, you know, and there are two stories that they're often thought about as quite distinct. And instead, instead it stitches them together. It says, this is one story. And it does that um, by pointing to exactly what seems to keep them apart, um, which is, you know, that they're distinct in terms of race and gender. And it says, no, actually that's what brings them together. Um, and so I think that that's, that's one of the things that makes it amazing. Um, I wondered if you could just kind of briefly outline for us um, how those two different stories are kind of stitched together for you. Yeah, well, I'll say first, you know, I very consciously decided I wanted to try to understand the relationship between those two stories as a way of trying to uh, reckon with and sort of work through the kind of lingering power of the industrial worker, industrial society, over our political discourse, over you know the kind of scholarly discourses that I'm part of. It seemed to me that actually just breaking from that and moving on to study the new economy wouldn't do the work that I wanted to do of thinking about, I mean, anyone knows this, right? You to, to, to mourn something or to process its legacy, you, you can't just ignore it. You have, to, you have to deal with it and deal with how it lives on. Um, and um, so to sum up and kind of historically in answer to your question, Charles, um, the New Deal state extended what we could call social citizenship or kind of forms of economic security to the working class primarily and centrally through collective bargaining in the private sector, particularly in manufacturing, right? This was the kind of portal into economic security if you could go through it and it thereby established a perimeter within the working class, a large one, right? There were millions inside of it, but a perimeter within the working class uh, of a kind of protected circle. And then there were those who stood outside of it, right? And that generated a kind of unevenness within working class America from the 1930s onward that was heavily associated or sort of correlated with race and with gender in different ways. There were black industrial workers, there were uh, Latin, Latinx industrial workers in many places. Uh, but they were rarer and they generally were disfavored in where they stood in, inside the industrial workplace. They had the least desirable jobs. They were the last hired and the first fired. In steel, this meant they worked in particular in Coke ovens, which are incredibly toxic places to work that will destroy your body. Um, and women were largely not at all present, except in a few select industries, sort of in, inside this protected circle. And the way that they could get access to those protections was through marriage. Um, and I took that core relationship that around which working class life was organized, right? The, the nuclear family uh, through which security was dispersed through the breadwinner to his legal dependents. As a, that kind of became the uh, starting point of my thinking about it. Because it seemed to me that, you know, as feminists have been arguing now for a very long time, Right, that relationship was, on the one hand, dependent in the legal sense and in the economic sense, and that wages and benefits flowed from the workplace to the breadwinner and then therefrom to his family. Uh, but we also know it goes the other way, right? That, of course, working class women, housewives, uh, worked very, very hard reproducing uh, their families, their husbands, reproducing them as eligible sort of workers, raising their children to be future workers. And uh, you know, that seemed to me on its own worth further historical investigation, but also seemed like an important 
uh, problem I had to deal with in thinking about this kind of perimeter within the working class, because it's not just a question of inclusion and exclusion. If the outsiders are being mobilized to service the insiders, right? That they're, it's not just that they're, you know, we have it good and they don't have it. There's a relation between them. And it seemed to me that once I had recognized that, I started seeing this kind of relation in broader ways. So, you know, one of the main benefits that uh, economic citizenship, citizenship conferred was health insurance very famously. And we can talk more about that if, if you want to. Uh, but what is health insurance? Actually, what does it entitle you to, right? It entitles you to care. What is care? It's labor. And in particular, it's the labor in this period, especially uh, of overwhelmingly women, especially in a place like Pittsburgh, African-American women who themselves stood outside the perimeter, right? They weren't protected by the National Labor Relations Act. They weren't protected until the 1960s by the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is hours and wages and that kind of thing. And so the kind of model of the uh, male-headed single breadwinner household that was a, the kind of nucleus of working class social organization in general suddenly seemed to me like a kind of a larger, like a kind of microcosm of a larger structure, which served to keep the working class in its enfranchised and kind of po more powerful fractions alive and secure, and also generated this internal division within it. Yeah, I mean, I found one of the amazing things you do in the book is not only show the relationship, um, the, the family wage relationship and the relationship in the household between the male breadwinner and the woman at home uh, doing social reproductive labor, but also put that into the con context of kind of spatial hierarchies of Pittsburgh and of the residential segregation and the ecological environment too. And yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because I was really struck by the ways in which you show, and this is again, something you know, socialist feminists have talked about for many decades, the way in which the work of the home was also the work of the community. And there are all these different forms of sociality um, upholding um, the way in which the family is structured and so on, and the, and the way in which the, the industry is structured. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so the, I mean, Pittsburgh is a very hilly place, first of all. Um, and uh, that, you know, that, that actually went to be important in certain ways. And so if you think about the, th the three rivers that meet, right, that's why the city is there. Uh, and the steel mills are all built along the rivers because they need to be able to use the water for various purposes, most importantly shipping uh, of iron ore and coal and this kind of thing. Uh, so the, the river floor, the, the valley floor is industrial. Uh, and then, you know, you have these giant mills and these stacks rising above them. And uh, I describe in the book at one point what it'd be like in say 1960, if you walk out of a steel mill and walk uphill and over about, the first five minutes you would go, first you would go by the kind of commercial strip right by the mill, right, which is bars, pool halls, uh, you know, the union hall, maybe like a VFW. Um, and then uh, over the course of the next five minutes or so walking uphill, you would go through the black neighborhood, which is the lowest down in terms of altitude because it's the least desirable because it's the closest to the smokestacks, right? And the kind of emissions that are coming out of the mill, uh, which are, you know, graphite, and, sulfur and iron filings and all kinds of things. Um, then you would go through, uh, and these, these boundaries of segregation were often not very hard. Uh, they, they had been typically established in the interwar period uh, when, you know, many Southern Eastern European white people didn't, weren't yet sort of fully white in the sense that we think of it today. Um, and so you would go from the black neighborhood to the Slovak or the Polish or, you know, uh, maybe Czech neighborhood or something like that. Um, and, you know, you'd see the change in the churches and the, the ethnic, you know, fraternal organizations. And, uh, you know, then you keep walking uphill and you go through the Italian neighborhood and the Irish neighborhood. And after about a mile and a half or two miles, you would get to the ridgeline. And on top of the ridgeline, after the Irish neighborhood, you would, it would flatten out and you would get to where the managers lived. And that would be the highest above uh, the, the pollution that was coming from the valley floor all the time. So living in this kind of ecology, um, I mean, it was just filthy. And people just, you know, who, people who know Pittsburgh from before the 1980s, they always talk about just, it was, it was just incredibly dirty. Um, you know, you, I mean, you, your car every day with, with parked on the street would be covered in, in soot and dust and you'd have to clean it off. Your, your windows, your, your 
you know, your porch had to be swept multiple times a day. Uh, and this became a part of the kind of round of labor that uh, women had to do in the home. And, uh, you know, was a kind of constituent part of what it meant to kind of keep a home. Um, but as you were suggesting, Katrina, there was a kind of wider world uh, of relationships among households that developed in this on this neighborhood scale, often mediated by kin, but not always, you know, often through churches or ethnicity or things like that. Um, that, and we associate this in labor history with the earlier moment, the late 19th and early 20th century, the kind of these cultures of mutual aid and cooperation that working class people developed to survive. And one thing I found was that this was really still operating in this into the 60s and 70s in Pittsburgh and was developing in relationship to creeping job loss. So every post-war decade, there are fewer steel workers than there were the decade before. We think of the 80s as the time when the jobs all go away. Uh, but as many jobs were lost between 1950 and 1980 as 1980 and 1990. And as that's happening, you know, people have to move in with a relative and, you know, develop economies of scale with food and with housing and, you know, share and watch each other's kids and all this kind of thing. And that all develops kind of on this neighborhood scale. Um, Gabe, that's great. I wonder, um, I mean, I think one of the particularly useful things about your book at the present political moment, um, when we have, you know, a product of this period in the White House, and when there's a lot of nostalgia for, you know, the, the 1950s, for the Great Compression, for the New, New Deal order. Um, I think one of the impressive things your book does is it really, um, you know, it shows some of the achievements of the New Deal state in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but it doesn't just kind of draw out the typical conclusions about how this was, you know, an uneven achievement on the basis of race and gender. It also says something about um, how terrible and dangerous um, this was for even the kind of core members of the working class. Um, and so I wondered, um, you know, what does your book tell us about, you know, how should we, like, should we be looking back in this period with nostalgia? How useful is this in our present political moment? Yeah, I think nostalgia is not at all useful. I mean, I think we can look back with respect and, you know, honor for the achievements of workers' struggles in, in this period. And I, you know, I try to do that in the book. Um, and if I, if I can just interrupt you for one moment, I, I did wanna say, so there's one incredible story that you had told me so many times and so great to see it down in print. And so I wonder, I mean, this might be a, a moment to, to bring out the story about the rats. Uh -huh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, it's just so good. I feel like we're, you know, I'm yeah, all so for I interviewed it. the steel worker um, named Howard who, uh, had been a welder at Homestead Works, the famous Homestead Works, you know, iconic place in US labor history from the Battle of Homestead in 1892. Um, and Howard got a job there because his dad worked there, which is a classic thing, especially for white men in the skilled trades like welding um, and uh, in the early 60s. And, uh, you know, as I said, these are riverbank environments, right? And they're semi-enclosed and they're enormous and they're filthy and they're warm because of the processes that are happening. They're very warm. So, uh, you know, they're full of rats, like giant rats, horrible. <laughs> um, and so on uh, his first day, Howard gets warm, or, sorry, Howard brings his lunch in a paper bag, a sandwich in a paper bag. And there's no, you know, fridge you can leave it in. That's not how it works. You just like find a corner where you put it. Um, so he does that and the rats eat it. And the old guy said to him, oh yeah, you got to get one of these, you know, stainless steel pails. Um, that's why we have them. But for weeks, he doesn't do it. And he keeps bringing his lunch in the bag and it keeps getting eaten by the rats. And uh, he just, like, he's just hoping he's going to be okay this time. Uh, he doesn't want to get the pail uh, because if he gets the pail, it means that he's staying, right? It means that like his dad and his dad's dad, this is where he's going to spend the rest of his life. And he's 18. And he sees these old men around him whose bodies are just, you know, broken by and spirits are like, you know, really damaged by a lifetime of doing this work. You know, the heat and the noise and the daily humiliation of the foreman, even when, even after it's unionized and even when the union is powerful, right? It's just this kind of constant grind on the body and the spirit of the people who did it. And I thought I, that moment of like, I'm not going to buy the pail because that means accepting it. Um, I found to be very powerful. And once I recognized that, I started seeing moments like that all through this history. Uh, there are many things that were great for workers about having these jobs, but they also hated them. And 
In fact, almost all of them, at least some part of them, hated them. So you just talked about the bodies of the workers, and that's actually one of the main kind of causal um, parts of your story is how um, sickness is actually one of the main factors in the process of deindustrialization, de or maybe not main factor, but one of the threads that runs through um, the transition from this period into the next, or, or, or I guess you don't want to say the next, in, in as part of the whole period that you want to call the industrialization. It so happens. Talk a little time, bit about so. that. I mean, there is there is a shift. You do do a shift, but we can get to the shift. Yeah. Um, well, so. Um... You know, one thing that I started noticing, I was trying to understand where did the service economy come from? And, you know, why is healthcare the biggest part of it before I had a clear kind of analysis of this? And I started noticing um, that there were these kind of political struggles happening periodically, pretty minor, you know, bureaucratic, not getting a ton of notice over uh, in Pittsburgh, especially starting in the 70s over what health economists and policymakers call hospital utilization. Uh, which is how much our hospital, you know, how much hospital inpatient time is being generated in this urban economy. Uh, and the answer was uh, just an enormous amount. In 1979, um, Pittsburgh generated that year 1.6 inpatient days per capita. Um, that's to say if everyone went to the hospital in the pop that population that year, everyone would have spent a day and a half for a little more in the hospital that year. That's triple our current rate of hospital utilization. Um, that seemed insane to me, right? I was like, I had no idea that this was a feature. I mean, health policy, people knew that, right, that utilization used to be higher, but I, I was, wanted to understand what ca caused this. And as I dug into it, it became clear to me uh, that first of all, the steelworkers health plan itself was at the core of that. The steelworkers had won this incredible health plan, Blue Cross plan, um, in 1949 initially, and then improved it, you know, over various contract cycles. Um, it was in a steel industry case, in fact, that the Supreme that the court system said uh, healthcare is a mandatory subject of collective collective bargaining. Um, and by the 70s, I mean they were just using the hell out of it. And I came to understand understand this as uh, the health system functioning as a kind of general social service. Uh, and this was, you know, from a different angle, how kind of more conservative or libertarian figures have often criticized the ele elements of health insurance and the way we do health insurance in this country, right? People overutilize. And I don't, I wouldn't describe it normatively that way, but that was what was happening in a certain, in a certain respect, which is to say, uh, people could and did use hospitals like sort of medium term care not quite nursing homes, not for months, but, and not without any reason, but they spent a lot of time, a lot more time in the hospital getting a kind of slower moving form of care than we now associate with hospital care. And that was driven first by the demand of the steel workers and their plan and their benefits. And it's not really just occupational hazard because it was their kids and their families and their wives too. Um, and then second, uh, as people were losing economic security, as this kind of kind of gradual diminishment of industrial work, that too was flowing into the form of patient demand. And we can talk more if you want about why that was. But the welfare state, in other words, the way it had been constructed, uh, channeled the various kinds of social need that were coming out of the population through the doors of hospitals and therefore caused them to grow. Uh, great. So this wouldn't be an N plus one event if there weren't a little bit of an argument. Um, and so I wonder um, if I can uh, if I can challenge you a little bit on this this point, Gabe, which I think is, um, you know, one of the most provocative points of the book. Um, and, you know, you want to you partly want to bring out the exceptional nature of Pittsburgh, um, but also show how it, you know, the the exceptional parts of it kind of exemplify larger national trends. Um, and I mean, to me, one of the more interesting parts of the book is you have these charts that just show kind of hospital utilization um, and all of the places that, that kind of have off the charts utilization are these, the, the kind of centers of deindustrialization, um, in particular in the Northeast. Um, and yet when I look at them, they're not kind of, at least from what I can tell, they're not kind of orders of magnitude different from 
other places in the country. You know, they are much, they are higher, but they're not like three times higher, 10 times, 100 times higher. Um, and part of what I take you to be doing in the book is, you know, explaining how the specific American form of kind of welfare provision and healthcare provision kind of transforms from the 1950s to the 1990s uh, or the 1980s. And the argument, as I take it, is that um, this occurs um, through kind of the, you know, collapsing body of the industrial working class and how that is kind of provided for by, um, you know, a new service industry. Um, and yet I wondered, I mean, the, I, how, how central, how, how crucial is it that um, people have these kind of, you know, union healthcare plans when a similar transition seems to happen in other states where there are far fewer industrial workers, far, where there isn't really union provided healthcare. Um, yeah, what's the, what's, what, is the, what is the causal narrative that you're really telling us here? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, obviously, I mean, we don't only have a healthcare system in, you know, Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Buffalo and so on, where we have a healthcare system in the Sun Belt, in the South, where there was never much of a labor movement, where there was never much of an industrial economy. It is smaller in terms of employment. Uh, I mean, as a basically ironclad rule, it's smaller. Uh, McAllen, Texas, which famously featured in um, Atul Gawande's article in the New Yorker about overutilization of healthcare. Folks may remember that around the time of Obamacare. It was like this classic story of a hospital that you generated too much usage. And even today, McAllen is, I think, like among populous counties in the US, number 20 and the only place from the South or West, virtually, um, behind you know, these Rust Belt cities. Uh, but the real story, I think, has to do actually uh, with the kind of earlier history of the relationship between collective bargaining and employ employment based health insurance. So, you know, we we have employment based health insurance in this country, basically due to the labor movement. And it got general, you know, which began to bargain these health plans and link the employment relationship to this form of security uh, when, you know, Harry Truman failed to extend Social Security Act to cover health care, as he tried to do. Um, there had been health insurance before and, you know, sporadic experiments in connecting it to employment, but it wasn't a systematic pattern until, um, until organized labor began to do this uh, in the late 40s and early 50s. And, uh, you know, so that sort of set the pattern in some way for the whole country, union and non-union to some extent. But I think especially important was the fact that that drove up prices, right? Once you had these big pools of people getting health insurance for the first time through their employment, uh, the, the phenomenon that we now think of as kind of like part of nature, which is that healthcare prices rise constantly, that started, right? That, that originated then. Um, and that caused by the end of the 1950s, people who weren't wealthy or economically secure on their own and weren't members of the organized working class to begin to protest about the fact that they were being priced out of healthcare. And that, that's, the, that's the economic and political origins of Medicare and Medicaid, which are national policies, right? And channel income uh, into you know, the healthcare system on a national scale, although you know, track things that are particularly pronounced often in Northern cities. Um, but arose to round out the limits of the system that had been developed through collective bargaining. Great, I'm fully convinced. <laughs> you also do this really nice, I think uh, the later bit of the book, you do one more nice historical kind of trans transition that I want you to talk about before we start to maybe open it up or maybe talk about today, um, which is, I think I think it's 1983, is, that, is, it, is, is it 1983 where you basically say marks the shift from a kind of towards a corporate health system um, and a much more commodified health system um, compared to the earlier kind of, there's almost like an intermediary phase in the book. Can you talk a little bit about that moment of the kind of neoliberalization? I mean, you do talk about the way neoliberal 
um, conditions, you know, um, in terms of forms of life and working class life hit much earlier for various lower layers of the working class. But in terms of the policy shift, I think you kind of date it to the early 80s. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, so I think first you have to understand how from the mid 60s to the early 80s, uh, you know, even as industrial employment is getting increasingly unstable, the healthcare system is growing and growing and growing. And as I was describing earlier, absorbing a lot of that instability kind of into itself as a site that it could manage. Quite parallel to how we think of the carceral state uh, as a phenomenon that expanded to manage social dislocation and social, uh, you know, social damage. And, you know, we should think different things about those, but I think we can see them expanding together. Um, you know, in 1979, the Fed deflated the economy. It caused a kind of Great Depression scale economic disaster in these industrial cities. Uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh had unemployment peak at, I think, 17%. Um, and healthcare is unaffected. In fact, it grows faster uh, because, again, it can capitalize on this in various ways, it can feed on it. Uh, and so, as it happens on a national scale to some degree, you know, the increasing inflation of healthcare costs in contrast to the deflation and contraction, the deflation of the currency and the contraction of the national economy, um, Congress starts to kind of worry about, you know, healthcare costs as it does periodically and uh, moves in 1983 to change the system of Medicare reimbursement. And I know I, I always am worried I'm gonna lose people here because it sounds so incredibly bureaucratic and dry, but just bear with me. Um, from 65 to 83, the way the federal government reimbursed hospitals through Medicare was, quote, retrospective or cost plus. So, you know, they did whatever they were going to do with the patient. Uh, they did their accounting. They said, OK, it cost us X amount. Give us and then, you know, to Congress or to HHS, rather, give us 102 percent of that. Uh, and it meant that hospitals could essentially write themselves blank checks. Um, and that was the fiscal mechanism that allowed the healthcare sector to expand counter-cyclically against the contraction of the industrial economy. Uh, so, you know, Congress doesn't want to do that anymore. So they change it to a retrospective reimbursement system. And the way that works is they say, okay, we're going to generate about 500 possible kinds of sick you can be, you know, generate 500 diagnoses. Uh, um, and when you admit a patient to the hospital, you pick which one they have, and there is a price attached to it. And that's what you're getting. I mean, adjusted for regional costs and this kind of thing. That's what you're getting. You can keep them for a day and keep them for a month. That's your problem. So this is an effort to impose market discipline on the healthcare industry, right? To force uh, hospitals to economize, to compete, to specialize. And uh, in some regards, it's very successful. What happens is that Community hospitals, which have been doing great under the old system in Pittsburgh, like every mill, steel mill town, you know, there's the mill, and then like basically across the street, there's the associated hospital, and everyone who lives in the town goes to that hospital and have kind of intense relationships with them often, right? Their kids were born there, their parents died there. Um, those hospitals have been doing great under the old system where they can kind of function as quasi nursing homes. And that's completely uneconomical under this new system. So they're all incredibly destabilized economically by this. And over the, a period of about 10 years, they all go under. Um, academic hospitals, which have the capacity to do high reimbursing, complex, technologically or scientifically complex interventions, uh, their margins actually improve under this new regime. Um, and so they then gradually buy up the destabilized community hospitals. And what you get is this series of kind of cascading stratifications in the healthcare industry, uh, both in terms of access to care, right? There's a kind of these uh, fancy metropolitan institutions that compete on often global markets, you know, doing transplants and this kind of thing for people from all over the world. And then these kind of community hospitals that are suffering increasing disinvestment, but also in terms of employment, which is really what the heart of the book is about, uh, Academic hospitals get increasingly occupationally stratified. So, you know, as you have all these increasing specialties, you need a workforce that, you know, has all these kind of fine grained dif differentiations of skill. Um, and the kind of main nursing and nursing assistant type work that had defined the slower moving form of care that used to happen in community hospitals, that moves out of hospital walls 
and moves into nursing homes and into home care. And those become the main engines of employment growth as the healthcare system continues to have to do this function of keeping a destabilized population alive. That, you know, through kind of provision of basic care needs that happens more and more through home care and long-term care. And yeah, I found, that, I found that story really powerful and fascinating because it fits so well with the larger story about kind of the fragmentation of the value chain in, um, you know, neoliberal capitalism, let's say, um, where you kind of, you, you concentrate the high value, high capital intensity activities in one place. And I, and it was, it, I hadn't thought about it in, in hospitals because this kind of integration seems to occur, you know, the, the academic hospital buys up all the other hospitals. And so it seemed to go against that, but I just wasn't thinking, oh, actually they're just offloading this onto home care. Or they're offloading this onto nursing homes. Um, yeah. Should we, I, I want to encourage people to, to put some questions yeah. in the Q&A. We have a few there now. We already have a bunch and one kind of um, fits, well, is, is a provocation. So uh, Elizabeth Cohen asks um, whether the working class breadwinner was really more ideal um, than a reality of life. And I wonder if we can kind of join to that question. Um, for you to say a bit more about the changing status of women workers in your story and who they are and where they work and so on, because we kind of started off there, but just to round it back up. Yes. Uh, so that question, uh, the, that is absolutely right. Of course, that the bread one to the single breadwinner ideal. I, I quote, I quote your book on this. In fact, <laughs> in the book, Professor Cohen um, was always more of an ideal than a reality. However, in these kind of industrially intense labor markets, it approached reality somewhat more than elsewhere. So um, the, in 1960, although nationwide by 1960, women's labor force participation had increased significantly uh, you know, from the war or from the post-war displacement of women. Um, in Pittsburgh, it actually had, had not much for, uh, for married women, workforce participation rates were quite low. Uh, they were, for African-American women, um, kind of paradoxically, they were higher than for white women, but relative to African-American women nationwide, the gap was even larger than it was for white women relative to white women nationwide. And again, that's because of the labor market anomaly generated by the steel industry. Um, I think, you know, I sort of speculatively also might say that the stresses of steel production uh, is not just that it, it crowded out women from employment uh, in the direct and obvious way, but also that actually the, de the demands on housewives were also quite intense um, in, in that environment that I was describing earlier and dealing with not just the pollution and the filth and so on, but also you know getting ready for the periodic cyclical layoffs and strikes and all the other kind of social stresses that, uh, that, that came with all of that. Um, but of course it's true, right? That uh, throughout the post-war period, working class women did work, uh, again, especially African-American women, and they tended to, uh, in particular, go out and try to earn wages in a kind of crunch for their family. Uh, that, would, that would propel women into the workforce. And that crunch became increasingly sustained in the 70s and 80s and gradually translated into rapidly rising women's labor force participation and when they looked around and said, what industry is hiring? Where could I go? You know, there was one obvious candidate, which was healthcare. Uh, we have another question from uh, Simon Torricenta. Um, so first off, he says, uh, we might want to note that the Massachusetts Nurse Association will be picketing Cambridge Health Alliance tomorrow. So you might want to turn out and support them. Um, and then second, at various parts of the book, you hint that the rise of the healthcare industry is part of a broader socialization of care itself, which in some ways we might see as a positive phenomenon. If this is an ongoing secular trend, what does it portend in the future? Yes, well, thank you, Simon. That, that question gets to kind of my, I think the deeper level of the agenda of the book. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the idea of a society where, well, let me say this first. In 1977, Eddie Sedlowski ran for president of the United Steelworkers. He was a kind of left-wing insurgent candidate for president of the union. And he lost, not by much and possibly fraudulently, in part because he gave an interview to Penthouse of all places, where he said, um, 
you know, maybe actually there should be fewer steel workers. Maybe that's better. It's a waste of human capacity. Maybe we want people to be doctors instead. Um, and I, you know, I can see why that was not a wise thing to say in that political context, but there's something in the impulse of that, that um, I think is profound. And the book is trying to get at, which is that a society where people don't have to stare into the, you know, work in front of these boiling furnaces and break their bodies and risk death. And where instead what we do with our collective capacity to work is to take care of each other. Uh, and in particular to take care of the vulnerable, the sick and the old and the young. If you didn't know anything else about it, right? You would say that's the society I wanna live in over the one that mines, mines coal and smelts it, you know, smelts the iron and produces beams for tanks and stuff, whatever. Tanks aren't made out of beams, but you get my point. Um, and um, you, so I think Sadlowski's insight is the one that the book is trying to figure out, you know, what, what is, in what ways is this happening actually? And in a real way, it is happening, right? I mean, this, this sector has grown irresistibly. It looks likely to continue to do so. The economy is kind of gradually getting eaten up by it. Um, and on its own, I don't think that's bad. However, we've decided to, uh, you know, conscript poor women to do this work. Basically, that's, you know, with this, this insatiable demand that we have for care, uh, which I think is just actually a demand for social integration in some way, um, gets met through this marketized and bureau bureaucratized mechanism uh, that through the kind of racialized and gendered structure of labor markets winds up compelling the most vulnerable to meet the demand that we have. And so I think on the one hand, we are kind of moving not by conscious choice toward an inverted version. I, I forget on the one hand. I think we are moving not by conscious choice toward an inverted version of uh, a kind of society that we could want to live in. And that maybe creates social and political material to actually reach out and achieve that society. Okay, just to encourage other people to put questions in the chat, I actually kind of want to just ask you a kind of what is to be done question because you do you do suggest in the book that what we need is solidarity between those we have come in the pandemic to call essential workers um or not 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 necessarily just solidarity but you you suggest that there are shared interests between the surplus populations created by deindustrialization and um, care workers, and you say it's, you said this one claim, and I wanted to hear you talk about it, because you say it's the transfer of costs of health pro care provision that creates a community of interest between those. And that sounds very promising to me, and I'm very, um, I think, sympathetic, um, and I think it's a good way to think about this, but I want you to talk a little bit more and maybe defend it a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um, so, the, you know, one of the kind of fundamental dilemmas of the service economy in general, the care economy in particular, uh, even more capital intensive parts of it, like hospital care, is that it's very difficult to substitute capital for labor in any clear way, right? You can't really get more care per hour out of a care worker than you did yesterday or last year in the way that, you know, industrial production has generally figured out how to do. Um, and, or at least you can't do it steadily. Um, in the way that has been the basis of economic growth in capitalism, right? I mean, that principle is the basis of economic growth in capitalism. Um, and that sets up these zero-sum conflicts, economic conflicts between employers and employees uh, as employers want to hold down their labor costs, which are high, right? And their margins are low. So they want to press down labor costs as much as they can, which they try to do through suppressing wages and in particular suppressing staffing. So this is the main way that they pursue higher productivity is just hoping that fewer workers can get the same amount done. And if you talk to like any healthcare, healthcare worker in America, they will tell you this is, some, this is part of the fabric of their daily life. Um, and you know, obviously we all then encounter this phenomenon uh, of the kind of margins issue in healthcare in the form of price gouging, right? Um, I mean, just like the insane costs of healthcare and the ways that hospitals uh, charge us. And we also encounter it in the ways that we, people are often treated inhumanely, discharged really quickly, I mean, all kinds of things. Care is denied to, you know, certain populations. Um, so uh, this principle that everyone needs care, 
at some point in their life, at many points in their life, that their loved ones need care. The care is something that holds society together and that makes us part of it. Um, and the idea that, you know, there are people whose job it is to provide that, that potentially, and this is the argument you're getting at, right, that potentially creates a kind of broad form of social solidarity around the principle that everyone is entitled to care and that care should be high in quality and humane and provided by people who uh, are not being exploited in its provision. And that in fact, that will be the best kind of care from the, even the perspective of the, of the patient. Um, however, because our care system is privatized, it's been subcontracted by the public to private agents, i.e. hospitals and nursing homes and so on, um, the patient and the worker meet each other through the medium of price, right? Um, and that structurally pits them against each other in some way. Whereas if they meet each other through the medium of, let's say, tax, um, then potentially, or you know, other kinds of collective ownership one could imagine as well, um, one could imagine how the conflict could be aligned differently and the solidarities could be aligned differently. And this has generally been the story of education, primary and secondary education in this country, which unlike higher education is mainly public uh, in, in the last few years, especially as teachers have come to form a political, and parents have come, come to form a political block together because they don't encounter each other through markets, right? But rather through, theoretically anyway, democratic processes. Should we go for some more oh, questions no, for the Q&A? Oh. We've been able to hear you, Gabe, so it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions from the Q&A. Uh, so one question, um, I'm sorry, we're not going to get through all of them, but I'll, I'll just do a few. Can you speak to some of the global dimensions of the story? Um, I'm just going to read this one out. On the one hand, the transition out of industry into service is an advanced economy phenomenon that we share with large swaths of Europe and East Asia. On the other, this growing national economy of care is premised on the movement of dirty, backbreaking industrial work to elsewhere in the world system. Um, other, uh, uh, sorry, my screen just did something strange. Um, yeah, that's the question. Um, yeah, it's a very good and important question. And I can't say I have a really satisfying answer for it. I mean, it seems to me that um, the downward pressure on Industrial employment is a global phenomenon, as we've learned from Aaron Beninav. Um, and, you know, the deindustrialization is therefore happening, even in places that never, were never so thoroughly industrialized. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, a transition to a kind of care economy, I think we can understand as a way of transitioning to an economy less centered on growth and the carbon emissions associated with it, which is something that we obviously have to do urgently worldwide as soon as possible. Um, and so, you know, I think that there is a kind of theoretically global set of processes that, you know, can, around which one can conceptualize um, the industrialization transition to a care economy and how that could be made a good rather than bad thing. Um, Obviously, you know, the rise of service work in the wake of deindustrialization, as the question suggests, um, right, has, has, has occurred everywhere around the world in one form or another. I think it's channeled differently by different institutional forces, including the existing structure of welfare states in particular, um, which, call, I mean, I think the, what's universal, what's global is the pressure, the oversupply of labor relative to secure industrial work, and the pressure for that to flow into some kind of low margin, low productivity service work. Exactly where that pressure flows, policymakers, you know, and the, through the conflicts that they're involved in, political conflicts that they're involved in, the institutions they shape, direct that pressure significantly. Um, so I think we would want to think, if we want to think about this on a global scale, we want to think about not just healthcare, right? Because the person in this country might wind up as a nursing assistant, might in another country wind up working in childcare or education or food service, right? And the same pressures can cash out differently in different places. 
Um, great, yeah. I mean, I think the, the global context is especially helpful for this. Um, one way that you kind of frame that question is through um, what sociologists call this kind of trilemma of um, public service provision where you can either cut wages, um, raise debt, um, or what's the third one, Gabe? <laughs> uh, so it's a choice between low unemployment, low unemployment. Oh, low un yeah, unemployment, that's it. Um, and it strikes me, and I mean, so one thing you kind of suggest is that the US has chosen the option of, you know, cutting wages, um, at least relative to other places. And yet, one of the, I mean, one, one thing that I think your book brings out is like, well, the other thing we've chosen is high profit margins for um, healthcare firms. Um, and it's not as if, I mean, maybe in the global context, the US has less debt than Italy, um, but we still have plenty of debt. Um, and so I feel like I mean, in some ways we've chosen the worst, we've chosen all three, right? I mean, I guess, uh, like, so I wondered, um, I mean, it seemed like one, one of the things you're pointing to is um, as the costs go up, um, it, it becomes kind of inevitable that the US is going to have to choose some other option. Like this, the current, the current state of things is not really workable long-term. It's going to bring about some kind of crisis. Um, I don't know if that's, I'm putting words yeah, in your mouth, I mean, but I, I don't know if that's kind of dynamic and contradictory. Yeah, I think it's a kind of dynamic and contradictory situation, which is what's exciting about it, as well as what's inhumane and horrible about it, right? Because uh, I think it creates possibilities for imagining reworking our institutions and reworking the way that we take care of one another, and in so doing, transforming our political economy in a larger way. Uh, in fact, I think it makes some kind of contest like that over you know a generational time scale inevitable and we already have seen that in the form of the unsolvability of healthcare prices and healthcare costs in our national politics right that is the harbinger of this kind of unsolvable contradiction how we every president is like i'm going to crack this one and they never can because it actually is a site that concentrates this kind of larger set of contradictions that are only growing Great. So coming revolution, social contradictions. I think that's uh, that's where every book event of any kind should end. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Just, you know, I think I think we'll see this as a we'll see this as a as a growing line of conflict and social uh, social activity and political contestation. I would not make a more precise prediction. Than that. <laughs> Okay, I think we should probably wrap up, even though we have a lot of really great questions. So sorry we didn't get to your question, but thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for being here and celebrating Gabe's amazing book. And thank you, Harvard Bookstore. Thank you, Charles. Um, and thank you, Benjamin. Thanks so much to both of you and to, uh, and to the bookstore and then plus one. And then plus one. For an amazing book, and plus one. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank all of you for, for this wonderful conversation. Definitely one of the best and most timely ones we've had recently. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase The Next Shift at harvard.com. And I'm just going to repeat and say, please subscribe to N plus um, one. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep reading and stay safe, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.